<laughs> so, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Neil. I work for Replacement Parts Industries, and today we're going to be talking about tabletop and some stuff on bulk sterilizers. I'll try to be, um, we've got a lot of time, so uh, if anybody has any questions, please interrupt. We have uh, over an hour here, so uh, normally this takes less than that, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make it uh, worth your while. Um, so uh, this is the Midmark M9 Ultraclave. We're gonna be running this machine today. Um, I'm gonna talk about how the cycles work and how the machine operates, but before I can actually do that, there's something I have to take care of. First, um, we are going to be uh, checking the functionality of this machine, and something that we will need to do that with is a specialized thermometer that actually goes in the machine. It's, uh, we call it a maximum registering thermometer. It's sort of like an old-fashioned fever thermometer. Um, you have to shake it down when you finish with it, and it records the maximum temperature that the sterilizer reached. I'm going to pass it around to everybody after it's been running the machine so you can see what it looks like, but I want to get the machine started. So I'm going to put it in a tray in the machine. Now we've already gotten this machine out of the box and filled it with water, and I'm going to get it started, and we will uh, proceed from there. Now, okay. Hello. I tried you already. Oh. Hmm. Okay then. Well, this is not good. Uh, sorry about that. This thing is supposed to, they provide this. There we are. I don't know why that wouldn't work. Okay, so um, sterilizers. What are we talking about today? We're talking about steam sterilizers, things, machines that run with water. And um, that involves both tabletop and bulk sizes. And what do we really need to know to do sterilization? Well, in order to do sterilization, I can't get this thing to advance. Uh, there's three things we need to pay attention to. Temperature, pre oh, there it goes. Eh, it started, I don't know, for some reason now it's working. Temperature, pressure, and time. Um, you can sterilize in a boiling pot of water. You can sterilize in a pressure cooker. You can sterilize in a in bright sunlight if you don't wait long enough. Um, as long as you have you reach temperature for an exposure period, uh, pressure that's a little bit hard to get in sunlight. But these are the parameters that we're going to be looking at. So when we're talking about steam, we want to kind of talk about the conditions inside the machine and what ideally we would like. So we apply uh, a pool of water into the bottom of the machine, which we heat with a heating element. And what we want is something called saturated steam, where we're constantly creating and condensate, condensing steam, cycling through the machine that keeps everything nice and, and uniform, and we get good solid exposure. Unfortunately, if this condition doesn't happen, if we run out of water, what happens is we're going to create something called superheated steam. We're not making any more steam, we're not condensing anything, and under these circumstances, that steam can get hot enough to cut steel. Um, the, going from this condition to this condition can happen very quickly, and um, that's something we want to avoid in the sterilizer. Now, if we kind of look at this illustration, what do we have here? We have a closed chamber with the heating element in it. If we were to take a step back to, I'm sorry, take a step back to the beginnings of sterilization, this would be the equivalent of a pressure cooker that we probably have in our homes. I have one in my home. Basically, it's a sealed chamber, pressure cooker, the heat would come from the bottom. You'd have a way to check your steam pressure and circulate the steam in it. Now, Steam pressure behaves 
based on something called Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law says that under ideal conditions and at sea level, you should be able to reach this pressure with this temperature. If you do not reach those, you have a problem with your machine. If the machine, say, overpressurizes before you get into the proper temperature range, you, you've trapped air in the chamber, air will pressurize quicker than it heats, so you'll raise in pressure long before you raise in temperature. Boyle's law always applies, except when you're at altitude. If you're in a place like Denver, Albuquerque, places that are above mile high, top of you know Kilimanjaro or someplace, this no longer applies. And there are corrections for that based on altitude. Onward. So what we've got and what we want. So if you were looking at that illustration before, you might have said, hmm, you know, that doesn't really kind of work with the steam circulating itself. There's nothing really to move it. What we really want is to be able to prevent this from happening, where we have a layer of lighter steam at the top of the chamber because the heat is coming from the bottom, so it condenses up here, settles back down. We don't want this striation. What we really want, and I'm sorry, I seem to be getting right at the screen all the time, uh, what we really want is to be able to circulate that steam as a uniform consistency and move it through the instruments so that they all get exposed. Gosh. I usually call RPI. Yeah, call RPI. <laughs> there we go. Now I just reset it. <clears throat> Onto the presentation. So what we want to do here is circulate the steam at this point. Try that again. We want to create this. So there is a device that does that. It was invented. It's called it's called a bellows. So in the, the concept here is we allow the steam into the, from the chamber to flow into the bellows. Inside of this uh, center portion, there's a chamber. And in that chamber is sterile water. And what happens is as the steam comes in, it heats this chamber, these two plates expand to from each other. When they reach the boil, when this whole device reaches the boiling point of water, the internal steam in this chamber expands these plates out and you seal off this valve. That allows you to remove the cold air from the chamber and circulate the steam so you can create this situation. So this is the original diaphragm that uh, Midmark uses. There's also a um, upgrade to it. We sell it. Um, this is the RCB 100, and opposed to having two plates which have to move a larger distance, this has seven plates that have to move a smaller distance. This device is a little bit more expensive, but it tends to be a bit more reliable, a bit more accurate than this because the plates don't have to move as much. You're not stretching the metal as much. Now, uh, Midmark also came up with a third device that they use in these machines. These two guys look like old-fashioned gasoline filters. They're um, silver canisters that um, uh, look like an old-fashioned gasoline filter. This one is a brass cylinder, and um, it has a piece of wax in the middle that has a known expansion coefficient. So basically, they just heat it, it expands, and it presses this pin into an opening. It basically does the same thing as these do, but a different technology. OK, so um, when we step away from pressure cookers and want to go, why is the table right? Ah, that's what Okay, it's up there. So um, when we step away from uh, simple uh, pressure cookers, 
we get to the first level of a sterilizer. This is the first true sterilizer we're going to talk about. This actually is the Midmark M7. And basically what we have here is a reservoir for water. We have a valve that allows water to go from the reservoir into a sealed chamber. There's a door here that isn't illustrated. And we have a way of checking to be sure that the machine reached the proper temperature. And here's our bellows that lets us circulate the steam within the chamber so that the machine can actually uh, sterilize properly. We also, at the end of the cycle, are going to use the same valve to let the steam out of the chamber where it flows back into the reservoir and is recondensed into water for the next use of the machine. So uh, while we're on the subject of water, and while I'm totally making a mess here, um, let's kind of touch base on water. I have a jug, I don't know where it is, but these machines are particular about the water that's used. Um, we only put distilled water in them. There's a reason for that. You don't want to use spring water, mineral water, or anything that is used for human direct consumption because it has, uh, when they make that water, they actually put in uh, minerals and things to make it taste better. So in distilled water, we don't do anything like that. And looks like we have a wire kicked off in this thing. We'll get to that later. Stop. Shush. Okay. Onward. So this is the first level of sterilizers that we're going to look at. And uh, basically, this functions very well. On to the second level. So somebody decided that it would be really, really great to, instead of having one valve to do the jobs we need, they come up with a way to do it with two valves. Now this is the uh, plug, this is the valve system in a OCM, Pelton Crane OCM or OCR. And what you have here is two valves, one which allows water into the chamber and one which allows steam out of the chamber and back into the reservoir. We also have a series of switches that are used to control the electricity <laughs> to the heating elements. And we have a cam that is uh, turned by hand and allows the uh, operator to move the cycle from step to step. This is a mechanically driven device. Um, an operator has to actually stand and run it. I kind of think it's unique. I don't think you could name another piece of uh, electrical equipment where you have water, steam, and electricity all within inches of centimeters of each other. You know? I looked at that and went, oh my gosh, somebody's going to kill themselves. But it was, they've had it for years, and uh, there doesn't seems to work really, really well. So that's the second step that we're going to see. So we still need to be able to have control of water, control of steam, and control of electricity. So why do we want to do that? Well, in the newer machines such as these, we don't want to have somebody standing here turning this knob. We want, some, we want this to be run automatically. And I'm not going to go through these next couple of slides in details, but basically these are the things that are similar uh, between a manually driven machine and an automatically driven machine. And basically the only difference is who's actually turning the valves, the machine or human operator. And again, um, there are some features that we can get on an automated machine that you can't get on a manual machine, such as the ability to have diagnostic circuits, uh, the ability for alarms, and uh, the ability to uh, uh, be a bit more accurate. So, what does a computer need for, to, in order to actually run a sterilizer? We have inputs and temperature probes and pressure probes and sensors and the user, and we have outputs of uh, information and control systems. Okay, so going from this to an electronic machine, we have to have the ability to open and close these valves. Now, in the Midmark M9 and M11, they came up with an assembly that does that. 
I really like pass around. So if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to just start this running down the room here. If you guys wouldn't mind just sending it back. Now, you can take it apart. You can muck around with it. There is a tool that is used to open these. I'm going to pass it with it. Uh, it's called a spanner wrench, and um, it basically lets you get into these two holes so that you can take this assembly apart. So why do we have this? Well, we've got two valves, one to let steam into the chamber, and one to exhaust steam out, let water into the chamber, and one to exhaust steam out of the chamber electronically driven. Um, in a electronic machine like this, we also have um, displays that are used to actually uh, show the information. Just so you guys have an idea, I'm going to pass one of these around as well. This is the entire display assembly, except for a little keypad that goes into the front. Anybody's interested? Okay. So, where were we? Oh, yeah, valves. Um, there's some things we're going to talk about on these valves that are kind of interesting, uh, but we'll get to these again a little bit later. Onward. Okay, so um, Midmore made these machines in two styles, and um, I want to be sure that everyone understands what the difference is. So, the original Midmark M9 and M11 ultraclaves had a red display on the front, red LEDs, uh, lots of buttons, a little bit lower tech. The newer style one, such as the one we have here, has that liquid crystal display we're passing around and a front pal keypad. If you are ever called to go look at a machine and you don't know which version, because you will need to know this if you're ordering parts, ask them. Red numbers, green numbers. It's really important. The parts for this machine do not fit this machine. Okay, so any questions so far? Good. So now we're going to kind of talk about the cycles. Now, since this machine is giving me a fit, um, Maybe we're not going to be able to run it, but let's see. So the first step that we need in uh, getting the machine to run is to get water into the chamber. So basically what we're going to do, or what the machine's going to do, and you can see this is kind of illustrated, we're going to let we're going to um, let water into the chamber. And, uh, oops, hang on here. Get there we go. We're going to let water into the chamber. And in the back of the chamber, there is a device called a water level sensor. And the water level sensor knows when the water has reached proper level inside the chamber. Of course, we've got the door closed. We're going to be painting with water. Time. Um, and we want to, uh, the water level sensor will tell the machine when it's got enough water and then it will uh, stop the flow of water into the chamber. Okay, so the next step in the process would be to take the water and heat it to the point where we start producing steam. So, um, in order for that to happen, now in the old style machines, okay. So, um, in the old style machines, we had a bellows. Remember, there was that silver can or brass can. In this style machine, no bellows. What they've done is they've added a third additional valve. They call it an air solenoid. And basically what they do is they will open this, phase, this valve three times during the heat up phase of the cycle. And what that will allow the machine to do is take all the cold air off of the top of the steam and flow it back into the reservoir. 
Also, by the second time, when there's no more cold air left, we circulate the steam again so that once the machine has reached proper operating temperature and pressures, we've, com we've completely created the conditions we need for sterilization in the chamber. So that would be the second phase. The third phase, of course, is the sterilization. So in this uh, setup, we want to be able to monitor the steam to make sure that nothing happens to it. So we've closed off the air solenoid. We're not letting any more steam out. And we're measuring the pressure on the control PC more. Also, there's an input from a temperature sensor that's in the back of the chamber also to the control PC board. Moving right along, we need to be able to get the instruments out, be able to get them dry, and be able to get the steam out of the way. So we need to be able to vent the chamber. The way we vent the chamber is by opening this second valve and allowing the actual steam within the chamber to push all of the remaining water in the bottom of the chamber back through the valves and then back into the reservoir where it can be recondensed and used for the next cycle. Okay, so um, under normal circumstances, we'd be running this machine. This machine's giving us some problems. We're not going to worry about that. We're going to just keep moving right along. Okay, um, we're going to do some troubleshooting on, the, on, on what we're talking about. And um, the way we organized it was to take the machine and kind of look it over, okay? So basically what we've done on this, this style machine is we've drained the water, we've turned the machine on its left-hand side so the reservoir is down, and now we're looking at the bottom of the machine. And on the bottom of the machine is the trap door. And that trap door allows us access to a couple of things. First of all, down here, we have our connections for our heating element. That's what these are. Um, they have gaskets. These, these connections can oxidize. These wires, over time, the insulation can decay on them. This is something you should be looking at occasionally, especially if you're going to give it a thorough PM. Also down here, we have overheat switches. These overheat switches are used to determine if the machine gets above temperature. There are two of them. They are exactly the same, and they are connected in series. Um, these wires will also fail over time. These devices, because they're constantly getting heated and cooled, also will fail. We also have one other thing that we're talking about on the bottom here, and that is this fitting, and I think you were talking about that fitting, yes. So um, make sure this fitting stays tight. A leak sack, these fittings or this fitting can be hard to find, and um, they are uh, easily fixed, but you need no look for them. So you, if you ever look in a machine, you look in the side and there's junk under it, or there's water collected on the table, you might suspect these uh, have failed. Okay, so tech tip number one on the circuit boards. So um, we want to be sure that um, we keep up with what's going on in the machine. And uh, there's the lag thermometers that we were talking about earlier. So it doesn't look like we're running this machine anytime soon. I'm going to go ahead and pass these around. Um, you're not going to be able to tell, but Normally, they would be 274 degrees, if you would mind. Thank you so much. But um, there's a mercury column in there. And uh, basically, what you would do is, uh, when you were finished with it, you would shake that mercury column down. OK, so this is where we talk about using a lag thermometer and an external pressure gauge. If you are going to use the external pressure gauge, you would be putting it in this piece of tubing that goes between the sterilizing chamber and the PC board and allows us the opportunity to uh, get into a line. Um, 
in bulk sterilizers, I don't know if you guys are any of you familiar with bulk sterilizers, they have opportunities to do this without taking the machine apart. They have ports that let you put probes in and things in bulk sterilizers. In these tabletops, you can't do that. You actually have to break into the machine or put something in the chamber or open up a tube. There's no real ports that allowed into the uh, chamber itself. So this, that's how you would actually test it. Oh, and uh, these, the other thing this is mentioning is these little tie wraps. These, little, these two tie wraps right here are very important. If those tie wraps are not in place, you can have a pressure leak that does not involve the release of water. And this pressure transducer, if it gets information that is incorrect based on the temperature probe, this will, the board will be very unhappy with you. It doesn't uh, like that. So you need to be sure those tie wraps are in place. Okay, so. We're going to talk about the two different styles of machines again and the two different styles of circuit boards put in them. This is the newer style machine with the green liquid crystal display, and this is the board from the old style machine with the red display. And there are many differences between these two boards. One of the biggest difference is this connector on the bottom of the new style board. This connector carries a ground wire. On this original style board, and I don't know if everybody can see it, the only place this board gets grounded is through this connection right here. When this board is mounted in the machine, it fits on three plastic pins and one screw. If this screw is not here, you don't have any ground path to the circuit board, and uh, the, the numbers that the board will generate will be off. They'll be weird. So this ground point is important. But you know what? Midmark, well, what can I tell you? When they built this assembly, they actually put this on a metal bracket. Now, here's a metal bracket, but it's kind of different from the one that's in this machine. The metal bracket that this board fits on uh, connects to the bottom of the machine with two screws. Um, it's really important that when you work on that old style machine, that if you're going to do anything on the internal of the machine, you want to go ahead and pull this board out, pull that bracket out, look at the bottom of the bracket. Odds are where the two screws go through to make the connection between the bracket and the case of the machine, you're going to find two discs full of horrible rust. You need to get that rust off. You need to get that board, that bracket, to make a good electrical connection to the frame of the machine because the only place you get that ground point is here. Or, and the only place that it gets ground is through the two uh, screws that hold that bracket in place. So that's a really important tech point to be sure that you clean that rust out of there. Okay. Um, so, these, bo these boards are um, refurbished by our company, and um, if you are going to be sending them in for credit, we give you four credit to return the original board, you will be sending this board, the newer style board, with its mounting bracket, as you see it here. The older style board, we ask you to keep the mounting bracket and just send us the board. Okay, um, blown fuses. Now, we all like to hope that when we replace a fuse on something, it's going to fix our problem. Unfortunately, more times than not, if you just put fuses on these boards, it doesn't fix anything. All it does is let you blow more fuses. Um, the things that you want to check are going to be external to the board, such as the coils on the valves, uh, the drive motor, the um, temperature probe, the things that connect to the board. But unfortunately, more times than not, the reasons the fuses blow is because of bad relays. And there's nothing that you can do about it after the next day the board. So if you wind up looking at a machine and it's got blown fuses, odds are you probably looking at a new board. 
Now, uh, let's move on. Um, valve assemblies. So there are three different three different styles of valves that were used within um, the Midmark M9s and M11s. On the newer style machines, they are mounted on a metal block, which was around, it's over there somewhere. Um, on the older style machines, you have two separate valves connected together with uh, bits of fittings. And the valves also have a difference in their construction uh, based on rectifier it's used in them. And if I remember correctly, there is the information for it. So, if you call us and you're calling about the older style machines, not the newer ones, this one kind of doesn't apply, there's a different story that applies to the newer style machines, but on the older style machines, we're going to ask you about this. Do you know if your valve is full weight rectified? Okay, why do we want to full weight rectify an AC valve? Well, when you have um, alternating current going to a, a valve, you um, the coil in the valve will be changing in, mode, in magnetic polarity 60 times per second, just AC current, 60 cycles. So the inside of here, there's a coil, and that coil is going to change in polarity. Now, the, the stem within the valve, well, it doesn't really care that which way the magnet, magnetism runs through the coil. All it cares about is it wants to stay open when it's needed to be open. But because that cycling is going on within the valve, the, the magnetism breaks every 60th of a cycle, or 60 seconds, every 60th of a second, and um, the piston will drop slightly, okay? So it, it drops, it raises, drops, it raises. That creates heat, and we don't, they didn't want that. So what they did was they take the coil and they built into the coil a full wave, full wave bridge rectifier. Now, full wave bridge rectifier allows that coil to use, instead of the AC current that's being sent to it, it takes the AC and turns it into a rough DC. And that prevents that constant cycling, the heat that's generated in the coil, and that piston from buzzing. <laughs> So um, there, there's a reason we want to know about that, because in the um, AC valve, the internal parts were designed to help with that um, buzzing condition where the, where the piston wants to fall every 60th of a second. They put a little piece of copper inside the top of the bonnet, the top of the assembly. And that copper kind of hangs on to the magnetism a little bit and allows a bit less heating and a bit less jockeying of that, that piston. Unfortunately, if you don't have that little bit of copper in there, if you put a DC kit into a non-full wave bridge rectified valve, that valve will buzz. So if you ever go to a machine and you're rebuilding the valve and you put the kit in that you thought you needed and all of a sudden the valve starts buzzing, well, you've got the wrong kit. You've got a DC kit and an AC valve. Um, it's not, it happens. We're happy to, to make it right. We'll make sure that, that you have proper parts. Just let us know if you find that you're in that situation. You do want to pay attention. Okay, so um, on the new style machines, we have an automatic door opener. And the automatic door opener is a, um, well, it, it doesn't do a whole lot. Really, all it does is at the end of the cycle, it raises this little lever here, which goes into the door, and pops the door up about a half an inch, and it opens it for you, okay? All this, this, that's the only function that this motor does is to raise this lever and pop the door open for you at the end of the cycle. Now, there are machines made that don't have them. They call them the 
M9 or M11D. D means no door motor. I don't know why that means no door motor, but that's what it means. So um, if you run into a machine and uh, the door doesn't pop at the end of the cycle, um, this could be suspect. This entire chain of mechanical uh, hinge points could be floppy. The door pin in here could be floppy. But um, as long as this drive motor is working, it should pop the door open. OK, so we turn the machine to the front, and we're looking inside the door. Um, Part of our planned maintenance for this machine is to replace this gasket and to replace this half moon dam gasket. I'm going to pass this around. This is the entire planned maintenance kit for an M9 M11. Thank you so much. When you buy our, if you buy RPI door gaskets, uh, the, I'm sorry, let me back that up. In the original Midmark door gasket, you might find a wire ring. And there was a reason for that. Silicon that the silicon that everyone uses to make these door gaskets shrinks over time. It's a known condition of the material. Depending upon what uh, the formulation of the silicon is, you can control that shrinkage rate. Midmark, a number of years ago, had a problem with this door gasket shrinking too much. So what they decided to do was they made a wire. Uh, they took a piece of wire, welded the ends together, put it inside the DAF gasket, and the thought was, it, as the machine would shrink onto the, as the gasket would shrink onto the wire, it would eventually reach a point where it would stop shrinking. The wire would stop it. Doesn't work that way, unfortunately. All it really does, well, it just supports the gasket. There's no real use for it. In on the RPI gasket, we ask you to take that wire out of the out of the machine and throw it away. It doesn't do anything. You don't need it. Our gasket is not designed to support that wire. It doesn't help. If you were to put a wire in an RPI door gasket, our gasket's going to shrink just like everybody else's gasket. But instead of shrinking onto the wire and stopping, it continues to shrink and curves. So um, if you go to a site, guy's complaining that his door gasket's leaking, um, you put an RPI gasket in it originally, if they, you find a wire in that, odds are that's what caused their problem. It didn't let the gasket shrink uniformly. Also, you have a half moon gasket. Um, there were two different styles of these half moon gaskets used in the original M9s. The way this is held in place, there are two pins behind it. Um, on the old, very, very oldest machines, there is a right angle shelf welded on the inside of the door. You may never see one of those. They're pretty rare at this point. But if you ever do run into one that has that right angle shelf on it, we have a, a different dam gasket specifically for that situation. Just let us know what they look hard is. Um, when you work on the doors, there are a couple of things you want to pay attention to. First of all, you want to be sure that this uh, gasket rim, uh, when you take the gasket out, there's a groove in here. You want to be sure that groove is clean. So you go in there, you make sure that there's no gunk on it. <coughs> if you ever run into a situation where you put a gasket in, it doesn't seem to want to seal, you've taken it out, you've turned it around, you manipulated it in any way that you can think of, it still doesn't want to seal, there's a solution to that. Behind this door pan, there's a piece of, of um, fiber insulation. And because of the construction of the door, where you have a hinge point on one side and a lock on the other side, that uh, piece of insulation gets crushed um, 
closer on this edge than it does on this edge, and it will break down over time. If it does break down over time, your door is going to get hot. You're also going to, this pan is going to want to shift, and that will keep it from sealing up properly. The other place, of course, that you're going to want to check, um, the, door space, the other part of the PM package is this spring. When the door wants to open at the end of the cycle, the only thing that actually moves the door is this spring. It's included as part of the PM kit. If you find that um, the door doesn't pop far enough, or you, it seems a little lackadaisical, these can be doubled up to give you twice the force. Okay, now obviously we're talking about when you go to clean this machine, the other thing you want to pay attention to is the space surface on the chamber. You want to be sure that that's clean. If this gets stuff on it, it'll keep the door from sealing. So, um, water fill drain tube. We're talking about water here. We've already kind of pointed it out once, but I can't tell you uh, enough information about water in this machine. The other thing you don't want to do with water is you never, ever want to use deionized water. We use distilled water, not deionized water. There's a difference. In deionized water, they've actually removed all of the free electrically charged free radicals from the water. But water really, really wants those free radicals. So it will literally pull them out of the copper tubing, out of the brassware, out of anywhere it can find them. So it will, the ionized water will decay the tubing in the machine and can uh, damage the brassware. So only distilled, nothing with minerals in it and never deionized. This little note here about the water levels, kind of funny, um, occasionally we'll uh, get a call from somebody who said, my customer was complaining, they were running the machine, didn't know what happened, but there's a huge puddle on the front of the machine and I cannot find a leak. Okay, well that's really interesting. What we finally tracked it down to was they were filling the machine up so it was up here. Okay, and um, this, this, this is how you gauge how much water is in the reservoir. You've got a no-go area and you've got a green go area. But if they fill it all the way up to the tippy top, when the steam comes back into the reservoir, it tends to boil, or bubble the water in the reservoir, and that bubbling is transmitted through the reservoir into this tube and blows the water right out of it. So it's like, oh, okay. So we realized, you know, don't fill it up any higher than maybe an inch or two from the top. And that would never happen. Okie dokie, check, check number two for the door, the door switch. This is what determines whether your door is open or closed. That's how the machine knows. Um, those door switches are constantly getting exposed to steam. They do fill over time. Also, within this little bracket, there is a uh, plate of spring steel that actually activates the switch. It's got a little bend on the end of it. If your door switch will not work properly, um, first thing would be to replace it. But if that still doesn't solve it, that little bracket has snapped, and you can't actually activate the button on the top of the door switch. You want to keep an eye out for that one. Okay, so what are we talking about here in the back of the chamber? Well, we've got filters that are included in part of the plan maintenance kit. They are installed in two places. This one is where the uh, water enters the chamber and the steam leaves the chamber and we want to have this in place to keep any lid, a lid from packs or paper or anything from getting into the valves of the machine. We also have a spot here on the back of the machine where our pressure probe is connected. We want to have the pressure, uh, pressure transducer, not probe, pressure transducer. We want to have the pressure transducer see steam which is why it doesn't go under the water level. Also in the back of this machine, 
we have a water level sensor. That water level sensor can't, I'm, I'm sorry, we have a temperature probe. That temperature probe can become coated with lime scale or calcium. Um, we want to keep an eye out for that because that material can act as an insulator and throw off our temperature readings. We also have a water level sensor. The way this water level sensor works is the chamber is held at ground. It's got a ground wire connected directly to it. This disc is held at five volts. And when the water fills up to the point where it touches the disc, it grounds it out and the machine knows that and it stops filling at that point. This device can become coded in scale. Um, it can uh, become <coughs> shorted to the case of, to the chamber itself. Those are two ways that it fails and um, it's replaced from the back, uh, from the inside of the chamber through to the back of the chamber. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, the water level sensor? Yes, sir. Like on a, on a tug now, you can adjust how many seconds it fills. Why Correct. do you need, so if you have a sensor, why is there a... You know, the, the, there's a, tug now does things very different. Okay. And thank you for bringing that up. What tug now does, is it fills for a specific time, as you said. Yeah. And once it's past that time, it starts looking at this water, the water level sensor in Tut Tower. It doesn't ever look at it until it's past that time point. And what Tut Tower does is they want to know when that water level sensor is not conducted anymore, when it becomes exposed. And then it knows it has only so much more time worth of water left to finish the cycle. Okay. So when it becomes exposed, if you didn't start off with enough water, it's going to give you an error over to the electronic machine saying you're running out of water, you're not going to be able to complete the cycle. Yes. On the mid-mark machines, it does it absolutely backwards. It only fills up until it reaches that point, and once it's become conductive, it never looks at it again. It seems like the better it seems, well, both of them kind of have their pluses and minuses. If you have a large steam leak in this machine, it kind of doesn't see it because um, of other, it never really looks at how quickly the water level is dropping. You know? It will find it eventually because you'll eventually run out of steam, but um, it doesn't kind of look at it again. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> chamber face and interior. Stainless steel. What makes stainless steel stainless? There is a layer of oxide on the steel. Okay, and the way it gets there is a process called passivation. Now, if you need to clean the stainless steel on anything, mid marks, tut hours, your kitchen, appliances, you never use anything that contains chlorine. Um, there are specific stainless steel cleaners made don't have any chlorine in them. If you use a product that smells like bleach on anything stainless steel, you are actually removing the passivation, you're opening up pores in the steel, and it's going to go from stainless steel to rust. That's why you never use Comet on these, you never use Ajax, anything that smells like bleach. There are products such as Bonami, Barkeep Spren, anything specifically that says stainless steel cleaner you can use on the interior of a sterilizer if you need to. There's also cleaners manufactured specifically for the machines by brand name. We sell mid-clean to go into our into mid-mark sterilizers. There's cut hour cleaners, there's pelton cleaners, and there's mid-mark cleaners. Those cleaners are used to clean the internal parts, the tubings, the valve seats. But if you need something heavier, if they've gotten stuff in here that does, shouldn't be there, you need to scrub it, only use something like a um, Scotch Guard pad, not steel wool, of course, something, something that's plastic. Uh, Scotch Guard pads and something without chlorine, and you can get pretty much anything you need out off of this machine. Now, 
I've heard of some pretty nasty machines out there. People have melted plastics in them. Um, if you really get to the point that you can't get anything out, you may actually need to replace the heating element. This is the heating element is the hardest part to actually clean. The stainless steel is really easy to deal with, but getting stuff off that ink alloy is really tough. So uh, when you are looking at the machine, chamber face, interior, you also want to look at the heating element to make sure that it's not breaking down, coated in gunk, or uh, starting to pit. Because if these things ever fail, they make a nasty mess. One word. Heating element. Yeah, that's what we were just talking about there. Um, the other thing that this slide brings up is GFCIs. One of the biggest complaints we get about these machines is the doctor keeps saying it's popping the circuit breakers. Well, there's a reason for that. Sterilizers do not like being anywhere near GFCIs. The reason for that is a GFCI actually measures leakage current, right? For the people that are in hospitals, you know all about leakage current. Um, where can you develop leakage current in these machines? Well, inside of this heating element, there's a wire. And that wire is separated from the wall of the heating element by a very, very, very thin bit of an insulated powder. That powder can actually settle within the heating element. It can break down, somebody's banging on it, it can shift around, the wire can move. The closer the wire gets to the wall of that heating element, the more leakage current this machine is going to see. So if the guy's complaining about his GFCI, perhaps it's his breaker, not likely, but perhaps it's the heating element starting to fail and you're getting some conductive path from the wire to the outer jacket of the uh, ink alloy element. Okay. Um, well, we talked about the mortar level sensor before. It's electrically isolated. It's used to measure whether there's water in the chamber. It can become shorted to the chamber by, there's a couple of little insulators in the back of it. Those can be replaced. Um, also, uh, it can be gunked up and, and, and it, that will also require that you clean it in the gunk up. Uh, temperature sensor. Um, there is a possibility that de deposits could build up on it. Um, in this newer style machine, it's an RTD, so if you ever want to know if that temperature sensor is actually functional, it is, uh, you can easily measure its resistance and watch it change for the temperature. Okay, uh, chamber temperature verification. So, um, as we talked about before, we were running the machine, we would have a thermometer in it, and that thermometer needs to be on a tray. Please do not put the thermometer on the rack. It's too close to the heating oven. You want to measure the steam temperature smack in the middle, because that will be the best and or the hardest place for you to get good steam. Right? You, want, you don't want any air in here. All you want is good steam, so that's where you're going to wind up putting your temperature, your thermometer. Um, the RPT113, as I said before, is mercury filled. Be careful. Um, also, it requires shaking, manually shaking down before you can use it again. Yes, sir. Can you put it in with instruments? You can put it in with instruments. Not a problem at all. Of course, when you fill the machine up, um, you want to put it where steam is going to circulate around it. It's one more thing in that chamber. So try to not overload it when you're doing that. But yes, you absolutely can run it with instruments. Okay, so we're at the end of the presentation. Um, RPI, uh, this is a bit of information about RPI. We all have free technical support. Um, we have a full catalog, but we also have our full catalog on our web page. Um, I'm one of the technical support engineers at RPI. You can contact me directly. I didn't get a chance to put my business card on everybody's chairs, but I have some in my pocket. Um, if I miss giving you a business card, please let me know and I'll be happy to give you one. Um, if you have any questions about RPI, feel free to call me. 
On our website, we also offer free technical supports. Uh, we have videos of the presentation I just did. We have Reason we have other troubleshooting guides to other sterilizers and other modalities of uh, equipment that we sell parts for. Um, I'm going to try to fix this machine here in a minute, so we have plenty of time. Um, I'm open to questions. Is there anything that I can do to help? Yes, sir. Um, like, what's your brain? Is it like all over the U.S.? Uh, as a company, yes. Well, we 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 are the business is in is in Southern California. We ship internationally. We only have one office, and um, uh, we do presentations at the shows and at eighty. Um, how else can we help you, sir? Uh, are y'all on OEM? Yes, we manufacture repair parts for equipment. So technically speaking, we, we kind of are, because we do make uh, repair parts. Uh, sometimes we actually improve the original repair parts, but of course we're not making sterilizers. We, we are parts all the time. Yeah. So uh, I was, I'm actually going to repair on this one. Yeah, <laughs> just keep, you can help me. <laughs> <laughs> so in the bottom right there in the middle of uh -huh. the door, yeah. it keeps leaking like two tablespoons of water. Yes, yeah, that will happen when you open the when you open the door. Still pouring out. Um, the this right the groove will contain water, and you can see it dripping right there. That's normal. There's nothing you can do about that. Most people will just put a paper towel under the machine, and that'll absorb it enough to to make to help you with the design of the machine. Yes, sir. The people, the nurses in the clinic say, oh, no, we don't like that leak. It was new one before. I'm like, boy, it's seven years old. Yeah, well, and, and it probably was. They just forgot about it, you yeah. know. And they were using it without the filter, too. Oh, yeah. That, that, uh, uh, that filter actually is kind of important because it doesn't take very much gunk to keep these valves from functioning. You know, if you kind of, I think you looked at it before, there's a, the, the disc itself is what, quarter inch in diameter, and then the actual sealing surface is even smaller. You put a little bit of gunk on there, and you know, all bets are off. So you want to try to keep the water and the steam as clean as possible. I didn't do that. Okay. So I had a second question. Yeah. So, uh, so we, we can't take the wire off the original OEM gasket, only, only yours. We can only install yours without the metal ring. We do not want you to use the metal ring on our gasket. So if you are concerned that your customer is not going to want to use an RPI in your gasket, save the ring for them. I mean, you can buy the gaskets from Midmark directly. But um, in our gasket, it was designed specifically to not use the wire and not need the wire. Oh, so there, so the OEM still needs the wire. The OEM still, Midmark still sells that darn wire with <coughs> their, actually, they don't even sell it with the gasket. They sell it as a separate part, and they want you to transfer it from one gasket to the other. It causes more problems than it creates. I, I don't really understand it. The insulation part, uh, pad in the back, uh -huh. it, does that, would that get rid of, they told me that could get rid of that little two tables of water. Probably not, Probably uh, not right. unless unless it was actually happening during the running of the machine, not when the door opens at the end. It's the door opens. Yeah, it's, it's right if, if it's uh, if it's when the door opens, it's just that little bit of water that's accumulating in here, and so I can tap on it and get a couple of drops to fall out. So it, it never it, it it's it's not really it's in the design of the machine more than anything else. That insulation pad is not part of the item. No, the insulation pad is actually behind this metal ring. It's it's that big, and it sits. If you take the front of the door off, there's a bolt in the middle here. You take this whole piece off, and behind it, you'll find this big disc of, of fiber. So when that breaks down, it can cause the, the, the door from cause sealing the door, keep the door from sealing properly. That's a, that's a good place I go. Uh, every two years? Oh gosh, no. Only only if it fails. Only if it fails. Yeah. Uh, and they can go ten years and not fail. But in some cases, depending upon how they handle the machine and whether they're slamming the doors or something, it could fail sooner. Yes, sir. 
What's the most common thing that you need to replace? The most common thing, of course, is the plan maintenance kit. You should be doing that yearly. The next most common thing would be the bellows in the original style machines. They tend to accumulate crud and they won't seal anymore. So those are the good, those are the couple of things that you might want to look at. The, the one that fails but gives you the hardest problem is the in, is the gasket pad. What happened here? In the yeah, there's there. Um, no, why this is? Hello, are you doing anything? Anyway, where where the heating element goes through the wall of the chamber, there are two little gaskets, and they are of a fiber material. Ours are of fiber material. The original mid marks are a very thin sheet of Teflon. That thin, thin sheet of Teflon fails over time. And if you do develop a leak at the point where the um, heater goes through the chamber wall, it's really hard to find it. Um, you don't get a real obvious uh, fault code, but you do see crud that if you look inside the machine, you can't see it from here in the and in the old sound machine, there's room to see it. You can actually see underneath on the trap door a buildup of, of material. And that's a good clue that those uh, gaskets have failed. That's a that's a real tough one to find. Oh temp sensors mm -hmm. going bad, is that what would be the main thing for that? A bad gasket or the insulation not allowing? Uh, oh, it's old age. Just old age. Um, like how long? Uh, that's that's how much use guess. basically. That's, yeah, that's that's anybody's guess. But they break down over time. Uh, the, they're made out of phenolic, and phenolic can only take so many cycles. But um, if they're not broken down and they're telling you the truth and the machine is overheating, that's a different story. If they're not breaking down, the reason that this machine will overheat is normally based on water. If you run out of water, the machine goes from being saturated steam to super saturated steam, heats up really quickly, and the machine shuts itself down. On the older style machines, the over temperature uh, switches are installed in the hot leg coming out of the wall. So the machine will literally turn itself off. Your customer will say, I don't understand it. I was running it. I came back when the machine is dead. Well, what happened was the machine overheated. The over temperature switch triggered. The machine shut itself off. And you have to figure out where the water went. So basically what you would do in that case is you would start a cycle I recommend you open up the reservoir so you can see what's going on. When the machine fills up, the water level in the reservoir is going to drop. When the machine starts heating, the water is going to come back into the reservoir. And where the water is coming from will determine what your problem was. If it starts bubbling through the bottom of the reservoir, you've got a bad fill valve. The water is going into the chamber. It's getting hot. You're building up pressure. It's shoving the water back through the fill valve, and you're running out of water, and the machine overheats. If you see the water coming out of the condensing coil inside the reservoir, there's a long copper coil used to take the steam to convert it back into water. If you see water coming out of that when it's not supposed to, you have a bad vent valve, and the machine is running out of water and overheating. On the original style machine that has a bellows, if you keep the reservoir open and, heat and start the machine running, the bellows will hiss and spit and return water into the chamber until the machine gets to the boiling point of water about 212 to 220 degrees. At that point, the bellows is supposed to close and you should get little spits of water after that, a couple of drops every now and again. Um, if that doesn't happen and the bellows continues to release steam long after it's supposed to stop, 
the, you will run out of water eventually. Just hear the machine. You won't hear the machine hissing because the reservoir is closed. But if you have the reservoir open, you'll just see steam coming out until it just runs out. So, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, do any of the uh, landmarks they don't use uh, water pump? These or only filters? use gravity feed. For, for water. No, the type of areas, there are water pumps, yeah. yes. But this only uses gravity feed. And, and no um, air filters? Uh, no, no air filters. This is an open door drying. The, when, when the machine has finished the cycle, whether it's the older style machine with the pulse solenoid or the new style machine with, the, with a door motor, it literally pops the door open and then it starts the drying part of the cycle. So since this is what they call an open drawer drop, an open door drying system, it does not use any sort of air filter. It does not have a filter. But that, that, yeah. um, that small elbow under the chamber uh -huh. um, that I mentioned. The right angle? Yeah. Yeah. It, that small leak on it, because the tabletop had a slight uh, ink there, it was like to the front, mm -hmm. it, it would drip enough. And broke the front, so they're you know, the concept. It was uh, the whole, I guess, the work that we got was it's leaking too much from the door. Mm -hmm. But it's actually the yeah. elbow underneath it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it can be a little deceiving. Water on a table, people just yeah. guess where it's coming from. The other place that uh, you can get water on your tabletop, we didn't kind of talk about it in this today, but if you are. There's a pressure relief valve um, in these machines that is designed to open up should the machine ever over pressurize. Now, part of the maintenance, part of the user maintenance for this machine is they're supposed to trigger that uh, pre uh, over pressure. I'm sorry, they're supposed to trigger that safety relief valve once a month as part of their maintenance. Over time, that pressure relief valve that has a spring in it and some seats, and because they're doing this frequently, sometimes the springs will start to weaken or the seats will get a little bit damaged, and you'll start to get a little bit of steam leaking through the safety relief valve. Now, that safety relief valve, to prevent anybody from getting hurt, has a piece of neoprene tubing that directs any released steam to the bottom of the machine. So now you've got another place where you can accumulate water. You got a, you got water coming from the uh, gaskets on the heating elements. You've got water coming from that right angle fitting at the bottom of the chamber, and you can have water coming from your safety relief valve, and occasionally water coming from the door. And they, they run that. Relief valve during the, uh, they're supposed to do it once a month during what what they call a a, a dummy cycle, a non-run cycle. They just run the machine once, pop the safety relief valve to make sure it's functioning. I'm not really sure it's the best idea they ever came up with, but that's the op way the operator instructions work. Oh, uh, yeah. What uh, moist uh, but there's still moisture on the packs after the dry cycle. Moist packs. So the way um, there there are there are two issues. Okay, you can break that moist pack that problem down, and this also applies to bulk sterilizers as well. Moist packs and bulk sterilizers can be problematic. Lots of things going on in a tabletop sterilizer. Much simpler solutions. Two things can happen. The first thing that can happen. <coughs> is they've got those little chamber filters have become clogged. So when you fill water into the chamber, it goes through the chamber filter. It doesn't really care how long it takes, just as long as the water gets to the water level sensor. So if the chamber filter gets clogged, it doesn't care during the filling part. It takes an extra five or 10 seconds to fill. No one cares. When the machine is venting at the end of the cycle, however, it needs to be able to, to get all the steam and all the water out of the chamber before the door opens. So it basically uses the steam to push the water through the chamber filter 
and back into the reservoir so then the door will open. If that doesn't happen, if the chamber filters are clogged, it takes longer for the steam to press the water out, and in some cases, it will run out of steam, and you will wind up with water still in your chamber. And that will be, because the door will then pop, the heat will stay on, and that water in the bottom of the chamber will continue to steam and keep your back sweating. Right, now, on the um, older style machines, there's also an adjustment for that. So if your customer complains that they're still having wet packs and you've done, you've checked your filters, everything seems to be all right, you can actually turn up the duty cycle on the dry part of the cycle in the older style machines. The newer ones, you can't do that, then they have less problems with wet packs. Anyway. Then we're using the sheet without these filters. One of them was rusted at the bottom and the one in the back. <laughs> so they are running that for months. I don't know how many months. Yeah, all the copper tubing probably has gunk in it. The valves have gunk in it. The worst place to accumulate gunk on these machines is in this manifold. Um, when Midmark originally made these, a good information, when Midmark originally made this assembly, they there's two channels that run down through this block. And in the original versions, you'll see that they put two um, stainless steel ball bearings. They press them in to seal off these two tracks. Well, somebody wasn't thinking that day because what happens is you now have created two dissimilar metals against each other, the stainless steel sitting next to the brass, and the stainless steel was starting to rust. So they put these two balls in and they created a rust pocket. So these mm -hmm. things in the original ones clog up really easily with rust. On our version, we did not do that. We realized there was a problem. So we have two removable plugs. If you ever are concerned about this track, you can take the plugs out. You can go in there, clean all that material out if there is anything, put the plugs back in, and you're good to go. I guess Midmark liked that idea a lot because that's how they make it now. <laughs> so now I would just have to clean the whole pipe. You don't necessarily, they don't, in the newer style without those ball bearings, they don't tend to build up as much. It's not as often a problem. And the fact that you can buy this whole assembly just like this kind of makes it easier for a technician unless you were like refurbishing the machines, just to replace the whole thing and not even worry about cleaning it. <coughs> Anything else? Questions, questions, questions. On the, uh, the water level sensor, mm -hmm. I was reading, I think there's some of the information on the website about how to test that with a, with a meter. Yes, sir. I think I did it wrong, can you? <laughs> sure, <laughs> you the water one? level <laughs> sensor needs to be isolated from the chamber. There are layers of plastic around it that keep it isolated. So basically what you want to do is you want to put your, your you want to measure resistance, and you want to measure resistance from the back of the water level sensor to your ground screw, to any point on the chamber. And there should be infinite resistance between the water level sensor and the frame of the machine. So where the, where the wire comes in to a good Well, you can do that, or you, it's easier just to get to the back of it, just take the pan panel off, and you can go right to, the, right to the water level sensor itself, measure its resistance to case. Okay. Um, uh, if there's uh, no further questions, I thank you very much for attending.